My guest today is Professor Emil Martinek, who is Professor of Physics at the Enrico Fermi Institute and the College of the University of Chicago. His research focuses on string theory and particle physics. Welcome again, Emil. Hi. It, it feels like, I don't know this quantum mechanics, it feels like I just saw you 24 hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, time flies. <laughs> so, um, so, so I want to sort of um, go back to our discussion from yesterday. We, we talked about the four fundamental forces. We talked about gravity, thermal, e electromagnetism, strong force and weak force. Um, but we sort of skipped over a couple of things um, from, a, uh, from a timing perspective. Uh, but do you want to sort of put the, the four things that we talked about in context so that we can talk about what happened at the turn of last century, fairly minor things like relativity and quantum mechanics um, that we can talk a bit about. So do you want to put those things in context? Yeah, yeah. So I, I thought um, it might be useful to um, do a, a brief recap of yesterday's discussion um, and then weave into the, the, that discussion the, um, the things we skipped over. So uh, we talked yesterday about this idea that instead of having um, action at a distance, that uh, the modern paradigm since Maxwell is to have um, um, the forces mediated by fields. In the case of electromagnetism, it's the electromagnetic field. And so instead of this particle directly interacting with this particle over a distance, this particle emits an electromagnetic field that electromagnetic field then propagates over to where the other particle is, and the other particle then responds to its local electromagnetic environment. So it doesn't require a medium, right? Well, so, uh, yeah, so people were debating that question, um, indeed, around the turn of the 20th century, you know, is there some kind of medium in which the electromagnetic field propagates, what they called the ether? Um, and I think the modern understanding would be to say that the electromagnetic field itself is the medium. Um, and uh, so it has a physical you know, reality independent of the charges uh, that source it. Um, and so, that, and, that, and, and then we should seek to ascertain what are the properties of that medium. And so one of the things that, um, uh, that Einstein realized was, well, so, First of all, in our discussion yesterday, we saw that one of the aspects of unifying electricity and magnetism for Maxwell was a prediction that light was an electromagnetic wave. So, uh, so according to his equations, um, the dis if you if you wiggle this charge around, it makes a disturbance in the electromagnetic field, and it takes time for that disturbance to propagate from uh, this particle to this particle and the propagation goes at the speed of light. So that was the indication that light was an electromagnetic phenomenon. But then Einstein looked a little bit more carefully at the equations and realized that um, it, if you describe the electromagnetic field, you, you, you could, uh, the electromagnetic field has sort of like no um, natural preferred frame of reference. So, you know, if we think about, you know, describing dynamics, um, you know, I, 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 you and I could look at the same outside world, but, you know, you sitting in, in, in a chair, you know, uh, sitting still, and me in a car traveling at, say, you know, 50 kilometers per hour. Okay, and so we would have... What's, you know, a, what's the speed limit in Illinois? Is it 50? It's, uh, well, um, 50... It used to be 55. I think we're up to 70 now. <laughs> but uh, you know, suppose I'm traveling the speed limit, okay, and you're sitting still. But we're looking at the same outside world, and so we have two different descriptions of the same outside world. And in Newtonian mechanics, if we had three such observers making descriptions, say one of them traveling, one of them sitting still, one of them traveling at say half the speed limit and the other one traveling the speed limit, then um, uh, the descriptions are, are, are 
are regularly related in the sense that, um, you know, if I'm uh, if I have a description relative to your description that's moving at half the speed limit, okay, and then I'm moving at half the speed limit, the person who's moving um, at the speed at the speed limit, the, their, their their relation to me is the same as my relation to you because we're you know relative to each other we're both moving half the speed limit, right? Okay. And so you can sort of pi keep piling things up that way. You know, that third observer could be moving half the speed limit to somebody who's moving one and a half times the speed limit. And it, the velocities just keep adding linearly, OK? Um, and so that's how Newtonian mechanics works. You can describe physics in different frames of reference that are moving with respect to one another. Um, and they're related in a regular fashion. OK. but. What Einstein saw in writing down Maxwell's equations is that the Maxwell equations don't make reference to the velocity of the frame of reference. The speed of light that's cal predicted by Maxwell's theory doesn't depend on the state of the of motion of you. And so if you say what's you know, so so if I have you know a ray of light traveling through uh, the outside world and you and I describe it. OK, but you're moving relative to me. You might have thought that if you you measured the, the light ray moving at the speed of light and I was traveling at, you know, uh, 35 miles an hour, that I would see the light moving at the speed of light plus 35 miles an hour. Right. But that's not true. I, I, I see the same ray of light traveling at, thir at, at, the, at the same speed of light as you do. So, so any, any answer to say so, so the absoluteness of maximum speed, speed of light. Yeah. You, you say it sort of comes out of Maxwell's equations? Yes. Okay. So, so Maxwell's equation predicts that light travels with a, a, a well-defined universal velocity, the speed of light, and it doesn't matter how you move relative to the light ray, you will measure the light ray moving at the speed of light. The same speed of light as anybody else would measure. And that has a profound consequence, which is a loss of an absolute notion of time and what it means for things to be simultaneous. So what, what Einstein realized was that if, 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 I, if we Im try to impose on, on dynamics this notion of a universal speed limit for the propagation of disturbances, that something has to break. And the thing that breaks is the idea that you and I can, can agree what simultaneous means, OK? So, um, so, you know, you sitting still and me moving at half the speed limit, OK? Uh, you and your frame of reference, you know, might say, OK, what, you know, let's say we're both looking at two people and the two people are, um, you know, turning on uh, uh, a flashlight. OK, and you look at them and you say, ah, um, they both turned it on at the same time. OK, and I would look at the same phenomenon, the same, you know, situation but I'm moving relative to you at some velocity. And just because you thought they were simultaneous, I can predict using Einstein's uh, principle of relativity that I will observe the two people have turned on their flashlights at different times, mm -hmm. okay? And there's no way of making the, 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 um, the propagation of the light from their flashlight to, to the two of us be consistent without that loss of this universality of what it means for things to be simultaneous. Yeah, so so let's talk a little bit about this. So Einstein at the turn of last century had some interesting theories. Um, the first one was the special theory of relativity. So this was 1905, was it? Yes, and this is what I'm describing. This is the special theory. So. Um, and then what happened after that? So he went on to this sort of combining gravity with it, right? So, yes. yes. So when did that happen? Right. So that took him. So he immediately realized, you know, because of the similarity between um, Newton's law of gravity and Coulomb's law of electrostatics, that they're both, you know, charge one times charge two or mass one times mass two falling off with distance with an inverse square. 
So, um, you know, if the Maxwell paradigm that, you know, you make a disturbance in a field and then the field propagates and then the other object feels the, the disturbance in the field, if that's the paradigm, then there should be a version of that for the gravitational force as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took him 10 years to figure out um, exactly how that should work. So, so the idea, you know, sort of comes almost immediately, but then the sort of guiding principle for how, you know, what's the, the mathematical language in which you formulate the theory um, uh, was, was rather elusive. And, and, you know, in hindsight, understandably so. Um, so, it's, it's, yeah. it's so interesting, Avi. So, um, sort of Maxwell, late 1800s, right? Um, 1854, I think. So, those ideas were sort of foundational that pushed Einstein into, <laughs> in some sense, general theory of relativity. Yeah, so he was thinking about, so it's the, the history is kind of interesting. So Einstein was this uh, patent clerk in, in Switzerland. And one of the things that was coming across the patent offices at that time was that people were just, you know, electrifying communication. And, 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 um, uh, and so you had the ability to communicate, you know, using telegraphy uh, to distant places. Um, and, uh, uh, and so this, you know, you could, you could then start commuting to places at roughly the speed of light. And, and, uh, and so, you know, in the past, it didn't matter so much, you know, if somebody's clock in Berlin was off relative to somebody's <laughs> clock in Paris. Um, but, you know, at some point you want to, you know, uh, impose standards. Uh, you know, that there's a standard time, you know, all across Europe. Uh, and so, you know, this notion of the clock striking 12 everywhere in Europe at the same time becomes possible because you can send signals, you know, using the telegraph wires and say, okay, everybody agrees that the clocks should be striking 12, you know, at the same time. And we can actually verify that by sending signals. Okay. But of course, you know, that, that sending signals requires the use of electromagnetism. <laughs> <laughs> and those signals travel with a finite speed. And so it becomes a natural question of what does it mean if, if the process of verifying whether things are simultaneous involves sending light signals from place to place, mm -hmm. whether there could be some funny business with the finiteness of the propagation speed. And, uh, and indeed, that's what Einstein realized was that uh, this notion of synchronizing your clocks in distant places depended on, you know, well, we all have a constant rest frame, which is this, you know, sitting on the surface of the earth. Okay. But, um, but, uh, uh, you know, if you start repeating the same exercise with somebody traveling on a train between Berlin and Paris, uh, then the person on the train has this different notion of simultaneity than the person uh, sitting on the platform. So, so, so if you take Maxwell's equation and you stare at it long enough, would you be able to get to general theory of relativity? No, no. So it required another conceptual leap. And it came uh, a little bit beyond the 1905 special theory. And I think it was 1907. Um, he started thinking about not just uh, frames of reference moving at constant velocity, but frames of reference that are accelerating. Hmm. And the, the, the sort of classic Gadakan experiment uh, he came up with was thinking about a person sitting in an elevator, riding up and down an elevator. And of course, you know, everybody experiences riding in an elevator, you know, say if you're on the top floor and the elevator starts to drop, you feel a little bit lighter and your stomach drops out a little bit. And then, and then, you, and then the elevator starts descending at constant velocity and everything's fine. And then you come down to the bottom and the elevator, you know, decelerates and all of a sudden you feel pushed down to the floor a little bit more than, than when it was uh, moving at constant velocity. So this is an indication that, you know, if you don't have reference to the outside world, if you're sitting in the elevator car and you can't see the outside world to compare to, how do you know whether, you know, your weight is whatever it is, or if it's in fact a little bit more because you happen to be in an accelerating, uh, you know, um, uh, um, environment. And, and so, so, uh, so 
started to think, well, maybe you can, you know, th this notion of accelerating frame of reference and gravitational force might be sort of two sides of the same coin. Mm. That they're sort of trade, you could trade one for the other. Or, mm. or at least you can't tell the difference without being able to compare to uh, things further away. To, to sort of determine what your frame, whether your frame of reference is accelerating or not, and you know relative to what, um, and so so this this is something he called the equivalence principle, that you can't tell the difference but locally, you know, sitting in isolation, you know, without being able to compare to your environment, you can't tell the difference between uh, being in uh, in a state of acceleration and being in a gravitational field, and so he then needed. Um, to formalize that in mathematical equations. So this like the idea is very simple to state in words, but then, okay, how do you put that into equations? And uh, it took a few years and um, friends of his suggested that he look into the work of the geometer Bernhard Riemann from the 19th century, who worked on the geometry of curved space. And the idea that um, your description, you, you could describe events uh, in, uh, in many different frames of reference, frames of reference moving at constant speed, frames of reference that are accelerating. So he had developed the mathematics for coping with this, of, of you know, removing the, the sort of, of description from the physics. That is, that, that, that diff you could have different descriptions of the same physics, okay? Um, he wasn't. He was an underachiever. I mean, he wasn't a mathematician. Um, Einstein, but, Einstein was not a mathematician, but he he realized that he needed some some new mathematics to describe the new physics. And uh, well, it was exist. It, for him, fortunately, it was it was mathematics that was already in existence and had been known for for several decades. Um, but um, but then applying it uh, so so. Uh, you know, to to get this arbitrariness of frames of reference, um, it was was related to the curvature of space and time. So he'd already sort of unified. You know, we're talking about you know ideas of unification before Einstein and before the special theory of relativity. There was space, the the arena in which you know things are moving around, and time, which is the you know the process of dynamics of things moving around from place to place in space. And after Einstein, space and time are 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 sort of unified into something we call space time. Um, and this idea that, you know, things in different places can be not simultaneous depending on, you know, your the frame from which you view them. So it's clear that the notion there is no notion of universal time in which we can talk about things being simultaneous over arbitrary distances. We have to sort of synchronize clocks and you know, engineer some um, uh, notion of what it means for things to be simultaneous. And if somebody else ch chose to use a different frame of reference, they would have a different set of notions of clocks being simultaneous in different places. And so, so there's no, you know, space and time are sort of transmutable into one another depending on the state of motion. Yeah, uh, I was thinking, Emil, that so for half a million years, Homo sapiens looked at stuff, um, tried to predict things, tried to understand yep. things. Till about 1915, all that hardware was still pretty useful <laughs> in the sense that we could visualize things. Um, yep. And uh, Einstein visualized using the human brain, yes. the big brain, I would say. <laughs> But it's a visualizable problem. I mean, even I can understand how gravity could work in that context. Then everything fell apart, right? <laughs> we got quantum mechanics. Yeah. And the human yeah. brain is not useful anymore. Well, I would I would actually um, maintain that already with Einstein and relativity, we're starting to leave um, things that you would call sort of manifestly obvious. I mean, for, for Newton and everybody from Newton until Einstein, it was manifestly obvious that there was this notion of universal time. And, um, you know, because that's that's our everyday experience. Why is it our everyday experience? It's because the speed of light is enormous. And 
and so when we're talking about me moving at half the speed of uh, of the um, speed limit, you know, relative to you, and having different you know notions of what it means to be simultaneous, um, that's an effect which is extremely tiny. How tiny is it? It's tiny in proportion to the speed limit of cars relative to the speed of light. Okay, the speed limit of cars is 70 miles an hour. The speed of light is 186,000 miles an hour. So it's a tiny, tiny effect. Uh, in yeah, the people driving around at 200 miles an hour around me. Yes. So, yeah. Right. So, so if you know, if you were traveling at half the speed of light, it wouldn't be negligible. Okay. But nobody, nobody on Earth travels half the speed of light. So, um, so it's it's an effect which is tiny and measurable, but ignorable for every for, for everybody's practical everyday life. Um, so, so that's sort of. In some sense, we are getting out of intuition, right? Yes. So Einstein's theory actually took us, as you say, took us away from sort of our general expectations of how how things work and how life yes. work. So time, time dilation was was really counterintuitive. That's this. right. That's right. And you know, there's there. I said you know it's not important for for every everyday life. It it does come up though. If you're trying to do something extremely precise, okay. So if you're work, you're trying to do some experiment that's working to a precision that requires you to care about small differences of velocities and so on, then it can become important. And one of the things that that comes out of the general theory of relativity um, is is this this idea that um, that masses warp the geometry of space time. A part of the this, this statement that 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 um, you know Einstein's theory is about the sort of warping of geometry um, is the notion of um, that things in different places can naturally have clocks that are running at different rates, um, and and so uh, in fact, if you take a clock on from the surface of the Earth and you launch it into a rocket that's orbiting the Earth, okay. Then, because the warping of space, you're further away from the Earth, the warping of space time is left less um, than the rate at which the geometry distorts the running of the clock is less in outer space than so it, it is. Runs, it runs slower. We, we have to do that for satellites, right? I mean, this GPS system that we have. That's right. right. That's what exactly what I was getting to. So, if you want to determine precisely where you are on the Earth. Uh, that's a uh, that can be done by um, comparing light signals sent from a system of satellites orbiting the Earth uh, to your location with your you know cell phone or whatever, and um, and so um, and so it it depends crucially on you know sort of like figuring out where you are on the surface of the Earth depends crucially on comparing the signals coming from you know different ones of these satellites um, sort of triangulating your position. But the satellites being in orbit, they're carrying their atomic clock so they can tell you very precisely when they sent the signal so that you can very precisely say when you receive the signal and determine you know how far you are from 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 the satellite by you know taking the time between when it was sent and when you received it and dividing by this and, and multiplying by the speed of light. And and so um, and so, if you didn't factor in this fact that the clocks up in orbit are running at a different rate than the clock, you know, on your cell phone, uh, you would get the wrong answer for where you are. <laughs> how how much uh, how, how much of a wrong answer would I be off by a city block? I th or... if I'm remembering correctly, it's like tens of meters. Tens of meters. Um, so it's not super far. Um, but who wants to be wrong by you know where you, you where you are by you know you you want to be sure that that you know when when Siri tells you to turn the corner <laughs> that there's a corner there. <laughs> yes, with my driving capabilities, I do need the the time correction for sure. Um, and so so now let's go into quantum mechanics. Yeah, this is where all intuition breaks down from a Homo sapien brain perspective, right? Yeah. So so how did we get here? I mean, it, it seems like it's a very unlikely thing for us to find. How did, how did 
I, I don't know, uh, Bohr and others get here? So it was forced on us um, by, again, observations of light and electromagnetic phenomena. Um, so, you know, the Thomson discovered the electron, as we talked about yesterday, and people, you know, knew and, and you know, people uh, also were realizing around that time that that the rest of matter is, you know, made up of atomic nuclei. And so, OK, you know, the atomic nuclei are, you know, bound states of protons. And, you know, very quickly people started to think about some model where the electrons are orbiting the protons in the atomic nucleus in the same way that massive bodies, you know, or, you know, the moon orbits the earth or the earth orbits the sun. Again, it's the same inverse square law. So, you know, if the earth can be in some stable orbit around the sun, um, then, um, uh, you know, why can't the electrons be in some stable orbits around, um, around uh, protons in, in atoms? And the problem with that is that, again, one of the predictions of Maxwell's theory is that if a particle is traveling in a circular orbit um, around uh, another particle, uh, it's accelerating. It's always accelerating towards the center of, you know, the, 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 the electron is always, as it orbits, it's always, excel it's always, its motion is curving. And the motion is curving means that it excess accelerating. It's accelerating in the direction of the of the atomic nucleus. And Maxwell's theory predicts that accelerated charges radiate. And so that, was, that was that was how we said the, the disturbance propagated from here to here was that you make a disturbance, you you wiggle the charge, you accelerate it, and it makes a disturbance in the electromagnetic field that propagates from here to here. Well, that disturbed electromagnetic field carries energy from here to here. Uh, and 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 so uh, if the electron were orbiting the atom, it would be continuously radiating, according to Maxwell's theory, electromagnetic energy, and the orbit then loses energy, the orbit decays, and it spirals into the nucleus. Within a fraction of a second, I would imagine. Within a right? short period of time. I'm not quite sure what the what the the numbers were. Um, and so you needed some new physics to explain why that isn't true. I mean, obviously atoms are stable. The electrons don't just dive into the nucleus and sit there. And so something has to be wrong with our conception of mechanics. And uh, so the first success came with Bohr's um, model that said that uh, as the electron is orbiting, for some reason, um, its, um, its motion is quantized, that it can only have certain discrete states of motion and jump between those states of motion. And so instead of continuously emitting, you know, if, if the electron wants to change its state of motion, it can only do so in discrete steps, um, quantized energies. And, and, and it was known that atoms have this sort of uh, discrete spectrum uh, by observing starlight um, that, uh, and then recreating the same thing in earth, earthbound laboratories that you can, you can sort of um, uh, split the light coming from a star into its various uh, frequency components um, and see that um, uh, that there are, are very sharp uh, so-called spectral lines uh, in in the starlight. It's not it's not just a continuous band of frequencies. That there are very specific frequencies. And then when people started doing enough in terms of like looking at very hot, um, uh, ex highly excited uh, atoms, watching them, you know, radiate, they saw that it pat the same pattern of radiation occurred that the light emitted from an excited atom decaying into a, a more uh, cooler state uh, came in again in discrete jumps. And so, so those discrete, was... those discrete jumps were known and, you know, cataloged throughout the late 19th century. And what was then awaiting was some explanation of what, what physics equations predict these discrete energy spectra of the light coming from excited atoms. So is this sort of the first break from classical physics in the sense that 
So when Earth goes around the sun, Earth is not emitting energy, and so it is constantly falling into the sun, and it can stay there, right? Ah, very good question. <laughs> so um, so uh, one of the predictions of Einstein's theory is that it's just like Maxwell's theory in the sense that in Maxwell, you uh, you know the 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 charged particle is accelerating, so you know it it accelerated particles emit radiation. Well, if Einstein's theory is modeled after the Maxwellian paradigm, then the Earth orbiting the sun should be emitting gravitational radiation. Mm. And indeed, that's true. And uh, sort of stepped up a little bit, that's what LIGO sees. Yeah. What does LIGO see? LIGO sees two massive dead stars, you know, black holes or neutron stars, orbiting one another. And as they orbit one another, they emit gravitational radiation. And as they emit gravitational radiation, their orbit decays. They spiral in closer and closer and speed up. And the last moments of that before the two black holes collide is the is this you know chirp signal that's that's observed in the LIGO observatory. But 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 by now, I mean if that's true, we should have in the center of the sun. Why does it feel like Chicago? Because it takes an extremely long time. <laughs> it's the weakness of the force of gravity. The fact that gravity is so much weaker than electromagnetism, an indication of how much weaker it is, is that the Earth has been orbiting the sun for you know, four billion years. <laughs> so, um, you know, it takes at least that long for the orbit to decay, but it will decay uh, uh, over time. But we won't decay um, before the sun becomes a red giant, I would imagine. That's but, right. That's uh, nothing that we have to worry about. <laughs> or any of our, our of our, uh, you know, grand, great, 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 you know, great to the 43rd children. <laughs> so, yeah, this will so. be with the next elections. Um, so, so, so going back to quantum mechanics, then. Yeah. Um, so, so there was a there was a reason because it didn't quite fit with classical theory. Yes. And um, the proponents of quantum mechanics have to come up with an idea why this is the case, right? Yeah. So what what had to be so again, this is sort of this question of like, okay, what do I have to give up, and what do I gain by giving it up? So for Einstein, you know, it was giving up simultaneity, gave him the principle of relativity that the speed of light is constant, and then you get some whole new dynamics, this relativistic dynamics. So in, in quantum mechanics, it's actually rather, rather fundamental change in perspective. You know, Newton said, tell me the positions and velocities of all the particles at some instant of time and the forces that they experience, and I'll tell you the motion forever after. You know, so it's sort of like a deterministic predictive dynamics that you, you sort of set things in motion at some early time, and, uh, and then the Newton's laws of motion tell you what's happening forever after. And the fundamental idea of, one of the fundamental properties of quantum mechanics is that you can't do that with infinite precision. Hmm that there's a limit to how precisely you can specify both the positions and the velocities of the particles. That's Heisenberg? That's Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, indeed. The, the idea that there's a fundamental limit on this sort of initial condition, you know, Newton would want these initial conditions to be precisely specified so that, uh, you know, as you evolve things forward in time, you know, you, you could worry that little error in measuring the position or the velocity, you know, might grow to some big mistake later on. Um, uh, something sometimes called the butterfly effect. Um, and and, uh, and, and uh, so, so quantum mechanics says, well, actually, you know, you can't do that with an infinite precision. Uh, and so, and, and what you have, you know, the, the more precisely you try to define the position of the particle, the less well-defined its momentum is, and vice versa. And the thing that relates them is his uncertainty principle that says the uncertainty in position, the uncertainty in the velocity or momentum, is determined by uh, a, the Planck's constant h-bar. So this is when my brain starts to hurt, Emil. So this is not an experimental issue. 
Mm. It is truly a theoretical issue. That and, is, right? The, it, yeah, sorry. You know, so if you if you measure position, you can measure momentum. If you measure momentum, you cannot measure position. It sounds like sort of an experimental limit, but that's not the case. So that is truly a theoretical issue. It's it it is an experimental issue, um, and um, it 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 comes together with a another fundamental feature of quantum mechanics which is something called wave particle duality that you know we ordinarily we think of a particle like the electron as a particle we can say you know here it is you know and and plunk it down and have it sit somewhere okay and measure its, you know, as it's sitting there, we can measure where it is more and more precisely. And then we think of light as being a wave, an electromagnetic wave, as we were saying uh, earlier. Okay. And in quantum mechanics, neither of those is exactly true. The electron is not just a particle, it's also a wave. And the light is not just a wave, it's also a particle, the photon. Mm. And uh, and so which of the those two sort of dual aspects of the thing we call light and the thing we call an electron, um, those dual aspects of, in some respects, looking like a wave, in some respects, looking like a particle, they play out when you try to make this measurement mm. uh, of where precisely the electron is. So the more and more precisely try, try to say where the electron is, the more it says I'm like a wave and I'm dispersed in space. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, the more and more my um, wave function of where I am spreads out because of the imprecision with which you determined what my momentum was, what the electron's momentum was. And, and you see this in, 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 in light. It was very, seen very early on, already in the 19th century, um, that if you try to specify where light is by sending it through a very narrow slit, um, uh, you know, well, the, the narrower you make the split, the more and more localized the light rays are that are passing through it. Okay? But what was seen was that on the other side of the slit, the beam of light is broadening out. <laughs> Right. And it's broadening out because of the uncertainty as it went through the slit of what its momentum was in this direction. Hmm. And so you you know if as you as you say more and more precisely where the light is uh, by making it go through this slit, which says that it's here in this direction, the more and more its momentum spreads out so that at later times it's much more spread out. Hmm. And so, yeah. so this idea of being infinitely able to specify both what the momentum is and what the uh, what the position is, is this very fundamental feature of quantum mechanics, and it's related to this wave-particle duality. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know much about this in here, but you know, I I grew up as an agnostic all my life. The more I I learn about quantum mechanics, I'm beginning to think there is a god. Uh, <laughs> And it seems so contrived in, in many ways. It's like he or she is watching a bunch of rats run around and you know she is you know fine-tuning this thing so that they will never <laughs> find it. <laughs> that well, it it is extremely counterintuitive, and it's because it deals with the, the atomic and subatomic realm that it's it's so divorced from our everyday experience. I mean, we're uh you know um 12 orders of magnitude bigger than atoms. Uh, so the fact that, you know, you can specify, you know, the position of something to with an atomic precision, the size of atoms and its momentum to within that same precision, that seems like, you know, well, okay, what's, what's the practical difference between that kind of precision and infinite precision? And and the, the point of quantum mechanics is to say no, uh, this lack of ability to precisely define the positions and momenta is the deep reason why atoms are stable, uh, and and that that uh, the orbits only come in in discrete uh, uh, sizes. 
So the orbits are fundamentally a probability distribution. Yes. Uh, rather than a particle. Yes. So 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 what you give up when you when uh, you give up classical mechanics is you give up classical determinism. Right. Newton said, if you give me all the positions and velocities, I give you deterministically the future of the universe. And uh, and, you know, uh, Bohr and Heisenberg and, and, and so on say, uh, well, that's an unreasonable thing to ask. You're, the, the thing you asked for, namely all the positions and the velocities with infinite precision, is an unreasonable thing to ask for. And the best you can do is you can ask for a probability distribution for where the particles are um, and, uh, um, and relatedly a probability distribution or, or alternatively a probability distribution for what the momenta are. And, and so it's that, it's that, that notion. So, so quant it's not to say we've given up determinism. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a subtle distinction. Uh, so quantum mechanics is deterministic, but the things that are deterministically propagating in time are these probability distributions. Right. Yeah, so I don't know if you looked into this area. So we have a similar concept in finance. So we have classical finance where everything is deterministic. So we have cash flows, we discount it, we come up with something called net present value. And we have what we call real options where everything is really probabilistic in nature. So we have to act, it's options pricing fundamentally. Um, not many people like it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so most of the finance folks um, believe the world is deterministic in nature. Uh, and there is a small population within there who says nothing is deterministic. Um, and so it's kind of curious, you know, we, we probably borrowed these ideas from physics, I would think. Yeah, so probability also comes up in, in other contexts, which are sort of classical and deterministic. Um, you know, you, you can, in, in, in statistical physics, so, so, so I would say that, that finance is maybe a little closer to statistical physics, where things are sort of microscopically deterministic, um, but you have imprecise knowledge of the microscopic state of you know who has how much cash and uh, what they're intending to do with it and so on and so forth, and so it's sort of it's it, it's useful to model the situations then by us by just saying well let me take a sort of a random sample of typical financial states of the world, <laughs> um, and try to make predictions on on the basis of that uh, uh, ignorance of the microscopics. Yeah, I mean, this is not your research, but it is beyond that. I mean, in the sense that, so when we think about the value of something, like a intellectual property patent or something like that, what we have is a combination of options, and how we can value is it by valuing the distributions of outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so we don't really have a precise estimate of anything. Really, we have distributions. So really, we have you know sort of interacting distributions progressing in time. Right. Um, most of finance is not about this, <laughs> uh, but it, you know the 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 more we think about it, it is actually quite quantum mechanical in its uh, in its stance. Yeah. Well, to the, you know, in, indeed, in the. It, to the extent that one's dealing with probabilities and and you know uncertainties about things that you're using a lot of the same words indeed, um, but so, so you know just mathematically what we do is we do stochastic simulation mm -hmm. and dynamic programming to get to what we want to. Um, yeah, so it's, it's day, similar in that problem. sense that sort of like the goal of the exercise is to figure out how to evolve the probability distribution. From some initial time to some future time, so you can say what's the most probable state of finance <laughs> later on, so I can anticipate that and place my bets as far as uh, uh, what will be profitable. So in yes. that sense, it's the, if the name of the game is to predict the evolution of the probability distribution, then yes, it's the same sort of enterprise. It's evolution of the probability. So I want to go go back to quantum mechanics. So we have a lot of puzzles here. So one one is this. 
um, idea of many worlds interpretation or what was called uh, in Netherlands, they got together and came up with something. Oh, the 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 wave function collapse. Yeah, the Copenhagen so, interpretation. Yeah. Do you yeah. want to talk a bit about that? Uh, yeah, so um, I don't want to spend too much time on it because I, I see we're already well into the hour. <laughs> um, uh, but it's it's um, uh, there have been be, because people you know live in the classical world but are trying to understand the quantum world. Um, they want to think about quantum mechanics not on its own terms, but in some kind of classical interpretation of what's going on. Um, and so, yeah, the many worlds interpretation and the Copenhagen, they're all ways of making yourself comfortable with the fact that quantum mechanics is weird. <laughs> um, and so it doesn't have anything to do with quantum mechanics in and of itself. The quantum the laws of quantum mechanics are completely precisely specified. And so it's more about, you know, you, how you interpret the outcomes of uh, quantum mechanics, uh, quantum mechanical processes and measurements made on quantum mechanical systems. Um, it's and, and about the interface, how does, a, how does a classical device like, um, you know, my, uh, you know, probe, uh, you know, measure, trying to measure where the electron is, um, you know, that, that probe is a sort of classical object. So, you know, how does the classical world of measuring devices interface with the quantum world of, you know, atomic uh, sized uh, systems? So it's a bridge to classical physics yes. in some sense. And so as a thought experiment, if if we had a quantum, mecha quantum mechanics expert 200,000 years ago, we might all be thinking like that by now. And if that were true, maybe 100,000 years from now, we won't think classically, we will think quantum mechanically. I think we'll always be hemmed in by our everyday experience. <laughs> Uh, which is entirely classical, um, and and you know, these debates have been going on for decades. I, let me say one thing about about you know, what what it means this sort of what is this classical quantum to classical you know bridge. It's basically um, that um, uh, it, that when you make a measurement of some you know, atomic system that's behaving quantum mechanically. What what it what is it that you're doing? You're um, you know, if if there's some uncertainty, you know, to the extent that there are like several possible outcomes, like the Schrodinger cat sort of paradox that people used to like to think about. Right? There there are two possible outcomes of some quantum measurement and then and then you decide what to do with your cat based on the outcome of the measurement. Was well, what have you done when you did that? You took something that was very quantum mechanical and in a very uncertain state, and you correlated it with the state of your cat uh, by doing some measurement. Okay, the cat is very classical. You know, the cat is, cat is not in some superposition of this state and that state. It, it you know, it's it's doing what it's doing. Um, okay, but um, by by taking the outcome of the quantum measurement and deciding what to do in the classical world with your with with uh, some macroscopic object um, you're correlating the quantum world uh, with the with the classical world and in the process making it more classical uh, yeah, I remember so, yeah heisenberg's daughter said um, her dad didn't like cats that, <laughs> that, was, that was really the reason <laughs> this whole thing happened um, so um, we, we probably won't be able to finish up today, Emil, but I want to sort of start this idea. So, so we talked about four different fundamental forces. Right. Um, we, we talked about some sort of, you know, sort of assimilation of it. Uh, electromagnetism was sort of the good first one. Uh, you mentioned gravity in some ways uh, was also an assimilation of different phenomena, different scales coming together. Um, and more lately, we have been able to get the strong force and weak force sort of assimilate. 
but we haven't been able to get gravity <laughs> into it. Right. And so I want to sort of set the context for, I mean, you are one of the proponents of string theory. Right. So, so why do we need it? And, and, and sort of, I want to talk about a little bit of the progression of string theory. From okay. It. Yeah, so, um, so I, we started off today's discussion talking about relativity and quantum mechanics because I wanted to um, set the stage for string theory by telling you what's common to all of the four fundamental forces. What makes them? What makes us think? You know that we could possibly unify them in some grand synthesis. Um, and so, so. Two, the components of that synthesis are relativity and quantum mechanics. Um, another is a notion of symmetry or local symmetry. Um, we talked yesterday about quarks and quarks coming in, in different varieties. I called them colors and I, I <laughs> wanted to, to say something about that. So, so it, it's uh, when we say that quarks, quarks have colors, it's purely an analogy. I don't mean that like there's a red one and a blue one and a green one. Um, I mean that that the quarks come in three types, uh, and the and the the sort of the structure of the theory is that there's a symmetry among the three different types that I can rotate one into the other freely, and the force between these three different kinds of objects is that um, the strong force field, the analog of the electromagnetic field, mm. is um, very intimately related with this symmetry of being able to rotate among the three different types independently in different places in space. There's sort of like a local frame of reference of what you mean by the quark's quote unquote color. Do they do they change inside the inside the proton neutron over time? So 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 the the way that a quark emits the strong force is by changing colors, is by changing type from red to blue or blue to green or green to red. That that change in the state of the quark between those those two those three different options. Uh, is you know the analog of oscillating around in in you know in um, in you know for an electromagnetic object, it's the the when you make that wiggling of the type of quark, uh, you you know, you in the process you emit what's called the gluon, the particle of the strong force uh, field. So they're uh, constantly constantly doing that. That's constantly happening, and so 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 the the quarks are constantly. Um, uh, changing their their type among the three, uh, and the the symmetry amongst all of the dif different types um, uh, is uh, is is uh, as I say intimately related to the structure of the um, the strong force uh, um, uh, you know so called chromomagnetic and chromoelectric fields. Yeah, and this, so I'm I'm a bit confused about this here. So. I read somewhere that there's sort of an ocean of quarks inside a proton or a neutron. It's not just the three that we typically think about. So yeah. how well, does that, one internalize that idea? That's well, that's also an aspect of quantum mechanics. So um, so in quantum mechanics, we very quickly learned after the advent of quantum mechanics that there aren't just particles in the world, there are also what are called antiparticles that the electron has a friend of the same mass, but the opposite electric charge called the positron. And quarks have antiquarks. And for every particle, there's a corresponding antiparticle. That's actually a symmetry of, of nature um, called charge conjugation. And, and, uh, and so, um, uh, and so because there's this fundamental uncertainty in position, momentum, also uncertainties in energy, um, you can have a little fluctuation, quantum mechanical fluctuation, where spontaneously out of the vacuum pops a quark and an antiquark. Mm. 
Now that costs you some energy. It costs you at least the energy of the masses of the quarks. Okay, but because it's quantum mechanics, you can sort of borrow that energy for a little while as long as you return it um, fairly quickly. Yeah, don't tell this to Bank of America. I think you know, this has some problems. <laughs> you yeah. have to return it before they notice it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you can borrow, you know, uh, a little bit of energy. Basically, you borrow it out of the ambient chromoelectric and chromomagnetic fields and create quarks and antiquarks. Um, and that's going on all the time. And so there's this sea of what are called virtual quarks in addition to this uh, fluctuating chromoelectric and chromomagnetic field. And so the, the proton is a mess. <laughs> it's it's this, this absolute soup of particles, uh, much more complicated than we were originally imagining of it as being some fundamental point-like thing. Right, yeah. But that's the nature of the strong force. Yeah, that's what worries me, you know, you know the, the more we look into stuff, the more complications we seem to find. And that brings us to sort of string theory. Um, well, uh, yeah, so I, I, I want to get there in, in littler steps. Yeah. Um, so, so I should say that uh, electromagnetism is again based on symmetry. Um, and the, the weak force is yet another symmetry. So there's sort of, in the standard model of particle physics, there are three separate forces, strong, electromagnetic, and weak. Each one comes with its own separate symmetry. And, um, and the, uh, the, the way that the Maxwell-like theory is constructed makes heavy use of those symmetry properties. And, um, and but, you know, you could say, well, then why don't the strong electromagnetic and weak forces all look the same? Why are they so different? Right, the strong force only acts within atomic nuclei. The electromagnetic force acts over huge distances, you know, as we propagate, you know, light signals from place to place. And the weak force is even weirder. It's this thing that turns, you know, electrons into neutrinos and quarks into other quarks. And, you know, it doesn't even respect the type of object. <laughs> that. Yeah. So, you know how how is it that that they're so different if they're all if the, if somehow the underlying principle is always the same? Mm. And the reason is that is that um, the 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 three theories are all in different what are called phases. Different what you might call different phases of matter. And and you know, in in when you learn about you know. Uh, science in elementary school, you learn there are three phases of matter, right? There's the gas, liquid, and solid, um, right? And 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 it's it's like that, right? Steam is very different from mm. ice, is very different from water, mm. okay? Yet they're all made up out of H2O molecules. They just behave in the, the atoms are, the molecules are in different configurations, uh, you know, different regimes of behavior with you know, different macroscopic properties. And so each of the three theories that are in the standard model is each in a different phase. Electromagnetism is, what's call, is in what's called the Coulomb phase because it, we experience the Coulomb force between charged particles. Uh, strong interactions are in what's called the confining phase because we never see individual quarks, for the reasons I was describing yesterday, we try to pull two quarks apart and a, a strong interaction chromomagnetic electric field develops between them, which keeps them bound together. The force gets stronger as you try to separate them. Hmm. And uh, and so that confines everything, you know, into, into this bubble, which is the, the proton. Um, and then in the weak theory is in what's called the Higgs phase. Not surprisingly, because uh, you know, the, this Higgs particle that was sort of the last piece of the standard model that was discovered about ten years ago, um, is intimately related to the structure of the weak interactions, mm. and um, and the the thing that it's different there is that is that um, the Higgs particle partially breaks the symmetry that underlies the 
um, the weak force. The weak force, if it weren't for the Higgs particle, the weak force and the strong force would be actually quite similar to each other. So is it the symmetry breaking of the weak force that gets it to mass? Yes, yes. So, so the, the idea is that the vacuum of space and time is permeated by this Higgs field. And one refers to it as the Higgs field as being condensed. Uh, so it's as if in the background there really was some kind of an ether, except the ether is this condensate of Higgs particles. Okay, and then particles get mass by trying to wade through this medium of condensed Higgs particles, mm. and in the process of interacting, they get slowed down below the speed of light. <laughs> it's almost like viscosity. It's almost it's like a, a little bit like viscosity, and so it's a little bit like uh, you know, uh, as I said, talking you know about you know gas versus liquid, so right, you know, walking through a room filled with steam versus walking through a room filled with water, you know, you're slowed down much more by, by, um, uh, it's a, it's a rather contrived analogy, but <laughs> it may suffice for this purpose that, you know, trying to walk through a room filled with water is much harder than you, you're slowed down much more than just walking through a room full of steam. Right. And so it's, it's a little bit like that sort of idea except that it's not like friction. It's not like viscosity in the sense that, you know, viscosity would eventually rob all of your kinetic energy yeah. and, you know, and you would eventually slow down and sit still. So, so this interaction with the Higgs field doesn't rob you of energy. Mm. It just gives you, it just gives you mass so that when you move, you know, you move it less than the speed of light. Mm. Uh, but you don't, you don't lose energy to the Higgs field by, by moving through it. Right, right. But what it what it does is is it breaks the symmetry, you know, the, the the symmetry which otherwise there would be between say electrons and neutrinos or between up and down quarks. If the Higgs field wasn't there, the up and down quarks would be symmetric in the same way that the three different colors of quarks are symmetric. Uh, but the fact the Higgs points, the Higgs condensate sort of points in a particular direction which distinguishes the up quarks from the down quarks. Hmm. And so, um, so it it, um, it it breaks the symmetry that's responsible for the the weak force being weak is because the Higgs field broke it, um, and uh, and and uh, made in the process made the uh, force carriers of the weak interaction themselves become massive in a way which makes them short ranged. Yeah, and so, it, it's an amazing thing that um, it was proposed. Maybe almost a, almost 100 years ago, not 100 years. I mean, Higgs is still, is Higgs still alive? Higgs, um, I think it's still alive. He was at the time that the, the yeah, yeah. Was discovered yeah. it 10 years ago. Yeah. I, I think he's still alive. Yeah, I mean, but 70, 80 up, years ago. up there in, in years. <laughs> the, yeah, his proposal was, and this idea of symmetry breaking um, is, uh, um, is Higgs and uh, um, Nambu and Goldstone um, you know, laid this all out in the early 1960s. Early 1960s, yeah. And, and the experimental could, verification had to wait half a century. Yeah, but we could create a machine that proves it. It's yes. an amazing accomplishment of engineering and physics. Absolutely. So, and so, so, I, so I wanted to, 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 to lay that structure out yeah. because it prepares the way for string theory. So people... After the after the standard model was sort of, you know, all the bricks were put into place um, in the early 1970s, people began thinking about, well, you know, is this all there is, or is there some deeper level of structure, right? Um, and so people came up with the idea of, well, if all the forces of the standard model are basically the same kind of what are called gauge forces, this idea of being able to do local symmetry rotations among the different types of object is called gauge symmetry. Mm. Um, and the particles, the photon, the gluon, the weak bosons are called gauge particles and the forces are gauge forces. So if each that's one all of them part is, of that's all part of standard model, right? That's and all part of standard model. Strength. And 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 gravity is very similar. You could ask, okay, what's the what's the symmetry, the local symmetry of gravity? It's this idea that that 
um, it doesn't matter what the local frame of reference is. This, the equivalence principle says that you can change local frames of reference and you don't change the description of the physics. Hmm. Um, and, 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 and so the, the idea that you can make little local frame, ro frame rotations or, or uh, you know, look at things in different local frames of reference uh, is the underlying symmetry of, uh, on which uh, Einstein's theory of gravity is based. So everything is this sort of same souped up Maxwellian paradigm yeah. that there's that there are forces. Forces are carried by fields. The fields have some local symmetry structure. And you just have to tell me what's the symmetry structure? Um, what are the matter particles? Um, how are they uh, responding to the field? How do they interact with the field? And, and, and then you go and you build your theory. And so the first thing people tried to do was to say, OK, let's try to unify all the forces in the standard model into one sort of big overarching construction. And the way people thought to do that was by enlarging the symmetry. To say that, well, if I want to say that that the strong, weak and electromagnetic forces are fundamentally all the same force, then there has to be some kind of symmetry that relates the weak charges to the strong charges to the electromagnetic charges. Mm. And so the idea is you make things more unified by increasing the amount of symmetry to make things that look different actually being related to one another by a symmetry. Right. Now, of course, I just got through telling you that that strong, weak and electromagnetic are in different phases. And so they look, and that's why they look very different. So that's saying that you sort of of um, make things unified by making things more symmetric. At the same time, you take away the symmetry by breaking it. <laughs> so, um, but but that's okay. Um, things are broken sort of in the everyday world where we experience these different forces. Okay. The idea of unification is that the symmetry should be restored if you look at sufficiently high energies and short distances. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, if we look at the Higgs field, which is our standard example of, of, of a broken symmetry in the, in the weak interactions, okay, the Higgs particle has a mass which is of order the energy scale 100 or 200 GeV of the, of the LHC. If you looked at energies much, much higher than the mass of the Higgs, you would find that the weak symmetry, rather than being broken, is more and more a symmetry of the interactions at those higher, higher energies. Hmm. And so there is not, it's not just vacuous. It's not just saying, well, let's introduce the symmetry at the same time, let's break it so it's not there. It's that you introduce the symmetry because the expectation is that if you start doing experiments at the energy scale and higher of the symmetry breaking, that you will start seeing the restored and more fundamental symmetry that unifies all the forces. So it's sort of regime dependent from an energy perspective, right? Yeah. What do you expect to see? That's right. Things are broken at low energies, but the symmetry is uh, evident and manifested at high energies. Yeah. And so it's this idea that 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 sort of you know layers and layers of structure. You know, things might be broken at one scale, but restored at another scale. And the question is sort of like, what is the most fundamental scale of nature? And what's the symmetry principle that operates at that scale? And maybe a little bit above that scale. So we ran out of, out of time today, Neil, but uh, we'll come back tomorrow. Okay. And then we'll talk all about string theory. Um, yeah. I have I have absolutely no clue uh, <laughs> what it means, but well, we've uh, we've, yeah. we've set the stage. Yeah. So we we know how the standard model works, how general relativity works, and how they're really all look this. They all obey these same fundamental principles of relativity, quantum mechanics, symmetry, gauge theory. They're all you different can't combine kinds. Combine them. And so the question is, can we combine them? Yeah. And what are the obstacles to combining them? What do we need to, what, you know, when we introduced relativity, we had to break simultaneity. When we introduced quantum mechanics, we had to break determinism. 
uh, of or, or classical determinism. So there's always something that you have to break in order to get something <laughs> in return. And there's so there's a cost to pay. There's, there's a cost, the cost to pay. And in string theory, it's quite a heavy cost to pay. <laughs> um, but this but, is a necessary progression that we have to make, right? I mean, we know there's something that needs to be done. The question is whether it's string theory or something else, but we will talk, we'll talk about the whole history of it. Sure. Tomorrow. Yes. Excellent. Thanks so much for spending time with me, Neil. My pleasure. Talk to you tomorrow.